It's the middle of December and I've been tripping over these I-beams for a month. It's time to straighten out a band, weld them together, or maybe weld them together and straighten out the band and turn this into a 40 foot chunk of five by 12 I-beam to use in a particular bearing condition. And I'm not sure how it's gonna happen, but we're gonna know a lot more by the time the sun goes down. So now that I'm confronting the reality of gravel floor and needing to get a beam nice and straight, I'm gonna have to play with this a little bit, but I think the laser will help me get it you know, within maybe an eighth of an inch. All right, so I'm gonna set a benchmark where this beam bears on this concrete on top of an inch and a half. I don't know, it just gives me a little room to shim and fudge and play around. So let's see what I need to do to get this raised up an inch and a half. I'm on the narrow setting as far as the tolerance on the laser. About like that. Back up a little, right there. Let's see what I gotta do to back down at that other six by six. Probably need about an inch. Very close. We're gonna go with that. Set this short one up, gonna be getting close. What I need to do now is butt weld these two pieces of I-beam together. And a butt weld is just not all that strong unless you V out the edges of the material so you can get somewhere near 100% penetration on your weld. So I picked up this big old grinder of my dad's. He's had it for years and it's got a carborundum stone on it because boy that thing will hog out the material. And the other thing it will do is give your forearms a workout. We're getting close. The bevel's in. Just gotta kind of true it up and then start clamping this thing together. So I learned when I moved that shipping container that these are called bridge clamps. Boy, are they handy. Boy, do they squeeze hard. So as you might expect, when this beam got the bend in it, it didn't beam, it didn't bend square, right? It didn't just nicely remain in a plane and bend. It's twisted a little bit, but hopefully, We'll get it out. If John Adolph was here, we'd sure get it out. But I think we're gonna make this work pretty good for the guy that's using it. Well, I'm ready to weld it. Tack it, then weld it. I've got the ends, you know, chamfered, V'd out so I can get close to 100% penetration. Not really where the flange ties into the web, but I'll tell myself it's 100%. The top of this thing is flat within the accuracy of the laser, which is decent, it's straight, from the butt joint about five feet back to the bend and then down this new piece. So once I get this thing welded together pretty good, I'm gonna put it up on sawhorses with the bend up and then worry about taking the bend out. We'll see how we do. MIG guns are terrific. Now they are best suited for welding in inside because of the gaseous shield blowing away in the wind but they will weld a wide range of metals from thick to thin depending on your machine and they're pretty darn easy to use. In fact, if you can run a nice bead of caulking, you can probably learn how to run a MIG gun. That little corner's down a little bit, but I just don't care. Everything else seems to be straight from the 14 piece, 14 foot piece to the center of the bow, straight for the 20, 6 feet on the other side 
I'm gonna weld this off hard and then figure out how to take that bend up. So my wire feed was messed up. I've got a BB stuck right there, I think putting friction on the feed. Didn't keep the nozzle dip on there. There we go. Smooth as silk. Leatherman to the rescue. Cut it off. Back to the nozzle dip. Full speed ahead. So now I've got a 41 foot beam with a kink right in the middle and it's not fully welded. So I think I gotta be a little careful turning it over that I don't tear those welds loose that are really only, I don't know, there's maybe six inches of bead on the tension side, right? Probably enough, but the beads on the two and a half inch, I don't know, we'll find out in a few minutes, but I'm just gonna be a little gentle. So two or three things. I've got this thing suspended about, no, 32 feet apart, quite a bit of weight in the middle, stretched two strings, one on this side, one on the other side, and we are two and a half inches out of straight hanging under this much load. The interesting thing is that the apex of the deflection is here on this side and over here about six inches down the piece on the other side, which accounts for the out of square bit that I mentioned. Second thing is that my crane quit. There's a little right there where the controller goes into the winch. There's a connection that pulls apart in there. It's been months since it did it. I was able to get unhooked, so I got to get up there and fix that. And then the third thing is I'm rigging up a little bit of cribbing right up underneath, going to come up to this distance right here so that when the beam settles down hopefully it'll come to rest on some support and not just keep going too far in the other direction i hope that makes a little sense we're going to catch that and uh, see if i've got a settling enough to get this thing hot enough to just sag down to where it goes Now John Adolph and Bob Bergman both told me that if I can get gravity to help with the shrinking that I'm trying to work on and trying to make happen, the progress is much faster and they just weren't kidding. The weight of this beam in this position is a big help. Now the fundamental concept of shrinking steel, as I understand it, is that when steel gets hot, real hot, you know, maybe over critical temperature in one spot, when it cools, 
it's smaller than it was before in that spot. Now, this is just a fact of creation that plagues fabricators all the time and occasionally gets them out of a jam. Now, I've seen and heard of guys that just use the ambient air temperature to cool the steel, that might use a garden hose to cool the steel, or that might just use wet rags, you know, to suck the heat away from the spot that they want to shrink. But a cooling gun radically increases the movement. It reduces the time and makes it more controllable, I think. What I'm using is just a cheap sandblasting pot that didn't work at all as a sandblaster, but makes an excellent cooling gun. My air pressure is set around 100 PSI, and the Venturi action out of the bottom of that pot creates a blast of water vapor that transfers the heat away in a hurry. I saw John Adolph do this in about 2006 at a Northwest Blacksmith Association conference in Kennewick, Washington, I think. I was blown away. And every time I get a chance to try this for myself, I'm blown away again at the creativity and the talent and the ambition of that old man and how he has helped so many people think and do new things. But I've got to say by the end of this project that I've learned just about enough about flame bending or about heat shrinking to know that I don't really know anything at all about it. Well, I lifted the end behind me up three quarters of an inch so I could get a little freeboard here. I'm going to go take that little block out and see if we're down to zero. I don't think we're going to be as straight as a string, but I think we may be straight enough to use it. Well, I'm cautiously optimistic. We've come quite a ways. I wish that crane wouldn't have quit. Hopefully, that'll be a small repair in the morning. We can stand this thing up and see what we've got. So maybe I've mentioned that this crane, the hoist, has just stopped working about maybe six times over the eight years that I've had this. <clears throat> and each time, it's one particular white wire. This one right here that comes loose from that blade connection right there. Seems to be the same thing today. Push that on there. There. The strain relief on this leaves much to be desired. If you guys want to suggest something to me that a non electrician is capable of doing, probably I just need to get another hoist, but it needs to be 120 volt, 110 volt single phase i don't have i could run 220 single phase but i don't want to run three phase out to this hoist i could do it but i don't want to so i don't know this is a one ton hoist works great michael shell has loaned it to me <sighs> thanks mike i hope it's in as good a shape when i give it back to you as it is now if assuming it works but anyway full speed ahead going to put her back together make sure she works in a fit of sanity, I decided to make sure it works before I put it back together. There it goes. New deal. When I had it standing on its edge, I had given up the advantage of gravity trying to help it shrink. In fact, I had lost a little ground with those four heats. I don't understand it. So I've got gravity pushing it down now. I'm three inches away from this cribbing pile. No, I'm three and three quarters away from the cribbing pile. If I can take it down to three, I think when I stand it up, we'll be close. I think cutting this and welding it back would be faster, but I want to learn something. I'm not sure, boys, but I think I might have gotten three quarters of an inch of drop with that one set of heats. I'm going to roll it up vertical and see where it comes to rest. All right, under the weight of gravity, which is probably about, I don't know, maybe 1,600 pounds, pushing, you know, 
half on that side, half on this side. We've come down three quarters of an inch. Let's see what it looks like when I unstress it and I have it just standing upright. You remember this 14 foot segment was about three eighths wider than the piece I tied into. So I set the string over, oh, a quarter, fat quarter. And this piece has got a little bit of a bend in it. The string swings over to where it's three eighths perhaps. And now we're coming up to the splice. And at the splice, we're zero on the edge of the bent beam. And here's the worst of it, but I'm not going to try to fix that. I've got five sixteenths in the open, and it comes down and maintains three sixteenths. Now we're down to an eighth. Still an eighth, and in the last four feet is touching. My friend Cy Swan, you've seen his videos on the channel. He's become such a friend. He and I have a saying that has derived from an experience he had when he was in his jewelry making phase. Did you know that, that Cy Swan made jewelry? What a renaissance man that old boy is. And he had an opal, and he had cast, lost wax cast, a ring setting with the little prongs and he was going to set it into the setting and it was for a loved member of his family. I don't remember which of his daughters, I don't remember, I don't remember, but he loved the opal. And opals increase their luster, their fire, he tells me, as you polish them. And he polished it and it was beautiful. And he polished it a little more and it was even more beautiful and he was setting it into the ring that he had cast, the gold ring, and he thought, I think I can get a little more fire out of that. And he went back to polish it and it cracked. It was done. He threw it away and had to start that process over again. And so if I try to get this beam any straighter, I'm going to be polishing the opal and I'm not going to do that. It's straight enough to build to. I've got a lot more work to do to it before I set it in place. I may, I may show you that, but right now I'm just sort of, vastly pleased that it started out in two pieces and one of them pretty darn crooked and now it's healed up and is going to do its work over 40 lineal feet straight enough to look really really good and if it looks real good probably it is good thanks for watching essential craftsmen and keep up the good work